Welcome to the Thought Decoders YouTube channel. My name is Sean Mixon. I am the Thought Decoder and I am the director of the Reasonable Fate Dallas uh, chapter. Tonight, we're going to come to you with another analysis of uh, William Lane Craig's toughest debate. We want to focus on the debate he did with Sean Carroll. Uh, in the two previous videos leading in this series, we, we looked at uh, Dr. Craig's opening statement. And just to summarize, basically what he's saying is that the evidence from cosmology gives, uh, provides uh, support for premises and arguments uh, for the existence of God, uh, specifically the Cologne cosmological argument, uh, the KCA, which says that whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. So the universe begins to exist. That second premise of the KCA, the evidence from cosmology provides support for that. The expansion of the universe, uh, the theorems, uh, the, the Borg, Guth, and Vilenkin uh, theorem, uh, as well as the theological argument that either uh, the design in the universe is due to chance, uh, necessity, or ne design, and it's not due to necessity or chance. And the fact that the universe had a beginning dis dis uh, disproves the fact that it's uh, due to chance. And then uh, the fine tune and show uh, uh, it's not ne necessary uh, if it has a beginning. That means it's contingent. Uh, that the universe is contingent. So it, it, it disproves that piece. And then the second piece is that it's not due to chance. And when we look at the fine tuning of the universe, uh, the, that how life exists within, a, uh, in order for life to exist, the, the um, parameters within the universe, certain mathematical quantities needed to be very uh, fine tuned. Hello, Sam Rosenstock. Uh, so, with that being said, let's get into uh, some of this. About what role God might have played. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. The Greer Her Herd Forum has been very wonderful. I thank Dr. Craig for participating. For everyone here, I appreciate your attendance. And I need to add a word of appreciation to this beautiful chapel that we're holding the event in. I just hope that somewhere in the middle of my talking, the roof does not fall on my head. <laughs> but if it does, that would be evidence, and I would update my beliefs accordingly. <laughs> I also want to... Uh, <laughs> I also want to start with a confession that my goal here is not to win a debate. The discussion we're having tonight does not reflect a debate. So right from the get go, we see that we see that Dr. Carroll is saying that this debate uh, that they're having is not a uh, it's not something that's that's uh, shared within the within the physicist community, as it were, uh, basically saying that no one is having that that debate. And uh, if no one's having that debate, then why was he at the debate, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> so he was literally a part of the debate. Uh, so we'll continue with his opening statement. I just want to point, point that out. Debate that is ongoing in the professional cosmology community. If you go to cosmology conferences, there's a lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. There is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. My goal is to explain why we think that. You may or may not agree with me at the end, but you should be able to understand why we cosmologists have that view. And it comes down to a conflict between two major fundamental pictures of the world, what philosophers would call ontologies, naturalism and theism. Naturalism says that all that exists is one world, the natural world, obeying laws of nature, which science can help us discover. Theism says that in addition to the natural world, there is something else, at the very least God, perhaps there are other things as well. I want to argue that naturalism is far and away the winner when it comes to cosmological explanation. 
And it comes down to three points. First, naturalism works. It accounts for the data we see. Second, the evidence is against theism. And third, theism is not well-defined. I'm going to be emphasizing this third point, because if you ask a theist about the definition, they will give you some very rigorous-sounding definition of what they mean by God, the most perfect being, the grounding for all existence, and so forth. There are thousands of such definitions, which is an issue, but the real problem is not with the definitions, it's when you connect the notion of God to the world we observe. That's where apparently an infinite amount of flexibility comes in, and I'm going to be inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. So I think I can make these points basically by following Dr. Craig's organization, starting with the Kalam cosmological argument. And unlike what he said I should be doing, I want to challenge the first of the premises. That if the universe began to exist, it has a transcendent cause. The problem with this premise is that it is false. There's almost no explanation or justification given for this premise in Dr. Craig's presentation. But there's a bigger problem with it, which is that it is not even false. The real problem is that these are not the right vocabulary words to be using when we discuss fundamental physics. And so, uh, Dr. Carroll may, makes a uh, interesting uh, objection to Dr. Uh, Craig's argument, and that's that he's not using the right vocabulary uh, to describe what's going on. So. He, he for, at first he said that it's false that if the universe uh, began to exist, then it has a transcendent cause. But then he changes that and say it's not even false. Well, if it's not false, then it's true, like logically, unless he has some other view of of, of truth or or he wants to say that that it's meaningless. That would be the uh, one of the other options. Uh, so, but it's that's that's interesting to say that the argument is 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 not is not false, <laughs> but it's it, he obviously he doesn't think it's true either. Uh, so, let's continue. And cosmology, this kind of Aristotelian analysis of causation, was cutting edge stuff twenty five hundred years ago. Today we know better. Our metaphysics must follow our physics. That's what the word metaphysics means. And modern physics, you open a quantum field theory textbook or a general relativity textbook, you will not find the words transcendent cause anywhere. What you find are differential equations. This reflects the fact that the way that physics is known to work these days is in terms of patterns, unbreakable rules, laws of nature. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. I uh, just want to point out that he just really begged the question uh, on his argument. If 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 the universe has unbreakable laws, then that just assumes that the guy couldn't intervene, which basically assumes naturalism. Uh, so that's a bit of circular reasoning. But uh, let's continue. There's no need for any extra metaphysical baggage like transcendent causes on top of that. It's precisely the wrong way to think about how the fundamental reality works. The question you should be asking is, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? By a model, I mean a formal mathematical system that purports to match on to what we observe. So if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? Can I build a model where the universe had a beginning but did not have a cause? The answer is yes, it's been done. 30 years ago, very famously, Stephen Hawking and Jim Hartle presented the no-boundary quantum cosmology model. The point about this model is not... Another point. Uh, Dr. Craig is interested, and in, I guess so, so is everyone else who's interested in these issues. We're interested in not what is possible, but what is true. Like what actually happened? Uh, anything is, I mean, you know, anything that's not logically contradictory is possible. Is, is is possible, but that's not interesting. Just because something is possible, we want to know what actually happened. So he's confusing. Uh, uh, well, his point is really irrelevant to the truth of if the uh, universe uh, began to exist, then it has a transcendent uh, cause. What he's trying to do is is refute that the hype, hypothetical there, 
to say that here's a possible look here's it's a possible world where the universe began to exist then it had and it did not have a transcendent cause and so he's he's showing how uh that's that's the case uh, on this model so the question would be uh is it true that there's a model of the universe uh beginning to exist and does and it does not have a transcendent cause uh are the models that's that stipulate what the causes are and what the causes are not, uh, which is interesting. It's like, oh, do, do, do the models have built into them uh, atheism? It's like, look, here's a model. God doesn't exist on this model. And the universe says, bam, it just begins to exist without a transcendent cause. Uh, it, that's an interesting point because earlier he just said that physicists don't discuss these these matters. So why would a, a physicist be interested in building a model uh, that doesn't have a transcendent cause to get it started? Uh, something to think about. That seems to be to refute that earlier point. Not that it's the right model. I don't think that we're anywhere near the right model yet. The point is that it is completely self-contained. It is an entire history of the universe which does not rely on anything outside. It just is like that. The demand for more than a complete and consistent model that fits the data is a relic of a pre-scientific view of the world. My claim is that if you had a perfect cosmological model that accounted for the data, you would go home and declare yourself having been victorious. You might also ask, could the universe be eternal, since Dr. Craig talked about this, without having a beginning at all? And again, the question is, yes, just build a model. This is my favorite model. It's actually not even a model that I think is right, once again. It's a model that I helped create. But it's about the search for models, not about saying that any one model is the right idea. We hope that someday we get there, but we don't claim that we are there yet. So whether or not the universe can be eternal does not come down to a conversation about abstract principles. It comes down to a conversation about building models and seeing which one provides the best account for what we see the universe to be doing. So I'd like to talk about the Bordeaux-Guth-Belenkin theorem since Dr. Craig. Well, this is interesting. The last statement he makes is that it's about building models and seeing uh, which model best accounts for the data that we observe. Uh, on that point, it seems that Dr. Craig's, um, one of his positions was that the inflationary uh, universe, the inflation model best explains the data. Uh, Alexander Blinken, uh, when he spoke for Stephen Hawking's birthday, he said that all the evidence that we had shows that the universe had had a beginning. So if all the evidence points to a, a temporal beginning of the universe, then the best, then all of the evidence, then the, that inflationary, that standard Big Bang model uh, is the best uh, model that explains the universe. And by his own reasoning, then that 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 model the model that Dr. Craig uh, claims supports the Cologne cosmological argument as well as the teleological argument, that is the best model and that's the best, it provides the best explanation. And then it tends to lead uh, credence to Dr. Craig's uh, argument. But what? let's see what Dr. Uh, Carroll has to say about this uh, Big Bang model. Craig emphasizes it. And the rough translation is that in some universes, not all, the space-time description that we have as a classical space-time breaks down at some point in the past. Where Dr. Craig says that the bordeaux Lenkin theorem implies the universe had a beginning, that is false. That is not what it says. What it says is that our ability to describe the universe classically, that is to say not including the effects of quantum mechanics, gives out. That may be because there's a beginning, or it may be because the universe is eternal, either because the assumptions of the theorem are violated or because quantum mechanics becomes important. If you need to invoke a theorem, because that's what you like to do, rather than building models, I would suggest the quantum eternity theorem. If you have a universe that obeys the conventional rules of quantum mechanics, has a non-zero energy, and the individual laws of physics are themselves not changing with time, that universe is necessarily eternal. The time parameter in Schrodinger's equation telling you how the universe evolves goes from minus infinity to infinity. 
Now, this might not be the definitive question, the definitive answer to the real world, because you can always violate the assumptions of the theorem, but because it takes quantum mechanics seriously, it's a much more likely starting point for analyzing the history of the universe. But again, I will keep reiterating what matters are the models, not the abstract. Now, it takes quantum mechanics seriously. Is the claim there that Board, Guth, and Vilenkin's theorem does not take quantum mechanics seriously, which shows that uh, any universe uh, expanding on average above zero cannot be uh, past time complete. Uh, it, it must it must have had a beginning. Uh, is he saying that that doesn't take uh, quantum mechanics seriously? And why think that? Is it because that that theorem doesn't support your claim that the universe is eternal, that uh, which which you're trying to show that it's false that there are other uh, that if the universe began to exist, then it's it has a transcendent cause. Is it is that is that why you're saying that it's doesn't take uh, quantum mechanics seriously? Interesting. Abstract principles. Now, Dr. Craig brings up an argument about the second law of thermodynamics, and I've written a whole book, you can buy it on Amazon right now from your iPhones, about the second law and its relationship to cosmology. It is certainly a true question, a true issue that we don't know why the early universe had a low entropy and entropy has ever been increasing. That's a good challenge for cosmology. To imagine that cosmologists cannot answer that question without somehow invoking God is a classic God of the gaps move. I know that Dr. Craig says that's not what he's doing, but then he does it. We don't know why the early universe had a low entropy, but that is not an argument that we can't figure it out. There's more than one possibility. Maybe there is a principle, like Stephen Hawking would say, that puts the early universe in a low entropy state. Or maybe there is no high entropy state. In my model of an eternal universe, the reason why our universe is always changing is because the universe always can change. There is no equilibrium for it to fall into. Dr. Craig brings up a quote, uh, he brings up various things that I think really muddle the cosmological picture here. He says that my model is not working very well because it violates unitarity, the conservation of information, and that is straightforwardly false. In my model, unitarity is the whole point. There's a quantum mechanical wave function that describes the evolution of the universe from one piece into multiple pieces, and that evolution is pure, is perfectly unitary. He quotes Stephen Hawking, backsliding in his statement about baby universes, but that was in the context of black holes that had nothing to do with cosmology. That quote was taken completely out of context. Finally, he makes a big deal about Boltzmann brains. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Most importantly, he talks about the fact that if the universe is eternal and you have a second law of thermodynamics, then there must have been a moment in the middle when the entropy was lowest, and he calls this a thermodynamic beginning and quotes another paper. That's fine, except it's equivocation on the word beginning. A thermodynamic beginning is not a beginning, it happens in the middle. It's a moment in the history of the universe from which the entropy is higher in one direction of time and the other direction of time. There is no room in such a conception for God to have brought the universe into existence at any one moment. If you really believe that the beginning of the universe is an important piece of evidence for God, an eternal universe with a low entropy state in the middle is not helping your case. What you should be doing is trying to build models, like I said. So the question is, are there realistic models of eternal cosmologies? Well, I spent half an hour on the internet. I was able to come up with about 17 different plausible looking models of eternal cosmology. I do not claim that any of these is the right answer. We're nowhere near the right answer yet. But you, you can come up with objections to every one of these models. You cannot say that they are not eternal. There, there's a theorem, Borde, Guth, and Belenkin, that has assumptions. So if you violate those assumptions, you can violate the theorem. Meanwhile, theism, I would argue, is not a serious cosmological model. That's because cosmology is a mature subject. We care about more things than just creating the universe. We care about specific details. At the cosmology conferences, we're discussing these questions that you see before you. I'm not going to list all of them, but a real cosmological model wants to predict what is the amount of density perturbation in the So I just want to point out that there is a bit of a uh, miscommunication here. Dr. Craig is arguing that cosmology 
acts as evidence in support of arguments for the existence of God, premises in the arguments for the existence of God. Sean Carroll is arguing, is arguing that theism as a cosmological model is not as, as good as some of the other 17 models that he, he uh, mentions. But it's interesting to me because who's, who claimed that theism was a cosmological model meant to explain uh, some of the data that we observe, uh, like a uh, red shift, uh, like uh, Dr. Hubble uh, observed with the, with the Hubble telescope. Uh, who, who claims that theism is a, a cosmological uh, model? Or, or something that physicists use. So it's like, this is a weak, like who is he arguing against? That's a straw man, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's when you create an argument and you tear that argument down. But the only problem is that no one's making that argument. So it's like you, you invent an argument to destroy, to say, look, look how bad their argument is. But the problem is you invented that argument. So uh, that's, I think that's uh that's kind of strange. Maybe he thinks Dr. Craig is trying to offer some type of uh, cosmological uh, model. And he did say that Dr. Craig was false about on some uh, some of the specifics. And I will be interested in seeing what Dr. Craig will come back and say in his in his rebuttal time. But let's continue. The universe and so forth. Theism does not even try to do this because ultimately theism is not well defined. So let's go to the second argument, the teleological argument from fine tuning. I'm very happy to admit right off the bat, this is the best argument that the theists have when it comes to cosmology. That's because it plays by the rules. You have phenomena, you have parameters of particle physics and cosmology, and then you have two different models, theism and naturalism, and you wanna compare which model is the best fit for the data. I applaud that general approach. Given that, it is still a terrible argument. It is not at all convincing. I will give you five quick reasons why theism does not offer a solution to the purported fine-tuning problem. First, I am by no means convinced that there is a fine-tuning problem. And again, Dr. Craig offered no evidence for it. It is certainly true that if you change the parameters of nature, our local conditions that we observe around us would change by a lot. I grant that quickly. I do not grant that therefore life could not exist. I will start granting that once someone tells me the conditions under which life can exist. What is the definition of life, for example? If it's just information processing, thinking, or something like that, there's a huge panoply of possibilities. They sound very science fiction-y, but then again, you're the one who's changing the parameters of the universe. The results are going to sound like they come from a science fiction novel. Sadly, we just don't know whether life could exist if the conditions of our universe were very different because we only see the universe that we see. Secondly, God doesn't need to fine tune anything. We talk about the parameters of physics and cosmology, the mass of the electron, the strength of gravity, and we say if they weren't the numbers that they were, then life itself could not exist. That really underestimates God by a lot, which is surprising from theists, I think. In theism, life is not purely physical. It's not purely a collection of atoms doing things like it is in naturalism. I would think that no matter what the atoms were doing, God could still create life. God doesn't care what the mass of the electron is. He can do what he wants. The only framework in which you can honestly say that the physical parameters of the universe must take on certain values in order for life to exist is naturalism. The third point is that the fine tunings that you think are there might go away once you understand the universe better. They might only be apparent. There's a famous example that theists like to give, or even cosmologists who haven't thought about it enough, that the expansion rate of the early universe is tuned to within one part in 10 to the 60th. That's the naive estimate back of the envelope pencil and paper you would do. But in this case, you can do better. You can go into the equations of general relativity and there is a correct rigorous derivation of the probability. And when you ask the same question using the correct equations, you find that the probability is one. All but a set of measure zero of early universe cosmologies have the right expansion rate to live for a long time and allow life to exist. I can't say that all parameters fit into that paradigm, but until we know the answer, we can't claim that they are definitely finely tuned. Number four, there's an obvious and easy naturalistic explanation in the form of the cosmological multiverse. People like to worry about the multiverse. It sounds extravagant. I claim the multiverse so he's he's doing like a rapid fire uh list of objections here 
And uh, it's interesting because let's, let's just look at some of the things he says. First, he says he's not sure there is a fine tuning problem. Uh, but before that, he says he loves the way this argument works. It seems like he, he likes arguments to the best uh, explanation, uh, arguments to the, to the inf inference of the best explanation type of arguments uh, where you have uh, data, then you come up with a hypothesis that best explains that data. Uh, however, I mean, having a preference for certain argument forms isn't a critique of an argument, uh, Dr. Carroll. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure you you know that. But so so expressing uh, which forms you like, it doesn't. I mean, it's just like me saying, I, well, you know, I like I don't like that suit. I like your blue suit. I mean, who, who cares? Like, to be honest with you. Uh, so then he says, what is life? Uh, then he asks, uh, God doesn't need to fine tune anything, but he, he kind of missed his point here because, uh, if God wanted us to, to observe, uh, to, to be aware of the universe and, uh, and, and to kind of look into it and like do science and things like this and find that, you know, that the stars are, the, the universe is magnificent and that it points to God. Like David said, the heavens declare your glory. If that's what God wanted to do, then obviously he would make the heavens finely tuned so that they would declare uh, his glory. Uh, so on, on our model, we would explain, we would expect to see fine tuning. Uh, then he says, uh, what parameter would life exist? Uh, he goes from saying that, that we don't know the parameters that life would exist. Then later on, he says, if you put in the correct formulas and the uh, and put in the correct data into the correct formulas, then the fact that life would come to exist within the universe <laughs> is one as a one. That means absolute, sir. That's the, that's the craziest argument that I've, I've ever heard it's like hey if you put the right numbers in the right place then bam it's almost certain certain that we would uh exist in this world but that's that that kind of uh, avoids the obvious point and it begs the, it begs the question that uh that we're trying to figure out and is that it's so easy to see why life would not exist and for him to make a claim that that's uh counterintuitive without any evidence and just claim that if we did the math right, uh, that, that's very suspicious and uh, it, it requires us to take his word for it since he didn't lay out any evidence for it. He just claimed that this was possible uh, to do. Uh, but let's continue. Verse is amazingly simple. It is not a theory. It is the prediction of physical theories that are themselves quite elegant, small, and self-contained that create universe after universes. There's no reason, no right that we have to expect that the whole entire universe looks like the conditions we have right now. But more importantly, if you take the multiverse as your starting point, you can make predictions. We live in an ensemble, and we should be able to predict the likelihoods that the conditions around us take different forms. So in cosmology papers dealing with the multiverse, you see graphs like this that try to predict the density of dark matter given other conditions in the multiverse. You do not see graphs like this in the theological papers trying to give God credit for explaining the fine tuning because theism is not well-defined. Now, Dr. Craig makes a lot about the Boltzmann brain problem, the problem that in the multiverse, we could just be random fluctuations rather than growing in the aftermath of a hot big bang. This is a significant misunderstanding of how the multiverse works. The multiverse doesn't say that everything that can possibly happen happens with equal probability. It says that there's a definite history of the multiverse and you can make predictions. Different multiverse models will have different ratios of ordinary observers to random observers. That's a good thing that helps us distinguish between viable models of the multiverse and non-viable models. And there are plenty of viable models where the Boltzmann brain or random fluctuations do not dominate. Furthermore, just as a little uh, preview of coming attractions, I'm trying to write a paper. Again, he just made the, the same I think this is a rhetorical uh, flaw to just claim the opposite without giving evidence. So he said there are a lot of models that where the Volt Boltzmann uh, of the multi world uh, hypothesis or model where the Boltzmann brain problem is not a problem. But he didn't mention those models. What models are those? And, and, and what is your evidence? So just 
it's almost like an argument from assertion where he thinks, I mean, he let me just assert the opposite of what he said and I, I'll refute him, you know, and that's not that's not an argument. You just you're begging the question. You're claiming that the opposite of what it was asserted without demonstrating it. Uh, so uh, let's continue. Paper when I'm not debating about God and cosmology, I'm a physicist, and I'm currently working on a paper that says that actually Boltzmann brains random fluctuations occur much, much less frequently than we previously believed. It comes down to a better understanding of quantum fluctuations. You know, there's a caricature of theism that says that theism is an excuse to stop thinking. You say that, oh, there's a problem, I don't need to solve it because God will solve it for me. That's clearly false because many theists think very carefully and very rigorously about many problems, but sometimes there's an element of truth to it. This is an example. You're faced with a Boltzmann brain problem and go, I get out of that by saying that God created a single universe that might have stopped you from thinking about the physics in a deeper way and discovering interesting facts like this. Fifth and most importantly, theism fails as an explanation. Even if you think the universe is finely tuned and you don't think that naturalism can solve it, theism certainly does not solve it. If you thought it did, if you played the game honestly, what you would say is, here is the universe that I expect to exist under theism. I will compare it to the data and see if it fits. What kind of universe would we expect? And I claim that over and over again, the universe we expect matches the predictions of naturalism, not theism. So the amount of tuning, if you thought that the physical parameters of our universe were tuned in order to allow life to exist, you would expect enough tuning, but not too much. Under naturalism, a physical mechanism could far over-tune by an incredibly large amount that has nothing to do with the existence of life, and that is exactly what we observe. Now he's saying, look, look here at, this, at the screen, uh, amount of fine tuning. We would expect it just enough fine tuning, but not too much fine tuning. But on naturalism, we would expect too much fine tuning. Did he just say earlier that he doesn't even believe that there's a fine tuning uh, problem? Uh, what what does he mean by just enough fine tuning? Enough for what? <laughs> enough for who? You know, that's, this seems to be very uh, subjective. What we would expect, uh, giving some a high, some statement, uh, what you would expect depends on the person, right? Your own uh, wiring, your own thoughts and beliefs. This is very uh, subjective. And this, it goes to the point, back to the point that we're not interested in models, we're interested in truth. Like if, if the models don't reflect reality, then what is even the point? Like, it's it, he has this this prag, pragmatism that a lot of scientific types uh, tend to have, where they just want uh, they want to if if something works, then it's true, you know, uh, which which is obviously is not true because a lot of things can work for you that's not not true at all. Uh, so let's continue. Observe, for example, the entropy of the early universe is much 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 lower than it needs to be to allow for life. You would expect under theism that the particles and parameters of particle physics would be enough to allow life to exist and have some structure that was designed for some reason. Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect them to be kind of random and a mess. Guess what? They are kind of random and a mess. You would expect under theism, life to play a special role in the universe. Under naturalism, you'd expect life to be very insignificant. I hope I don't need to tell you, life is very insignificant as far as the universe is concerned. Here is a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a few hundred out of the hundreds of life is insignificant as far as the universe is concerned. Is that a scientific claim, Dr. Carroll, that you discuss at these conferences with other physicists? How do you define significance? Just like if there's a problem with, with, with theism because we, the life isn't defined and is, isn't there not a problem with with the definition of significance especially if your definition is subjective and, and then what you think is significant or insignificant may depend on your own feelings and preferences and biases uh so i don't know billions of galaxies in our observable universe. The theistic explanation for cosmological fine-tuning asks you to look at this picture and say, I know why it's like that. 
It's because I was going to be here or we were going to be here. But there is nothing in our experience of the universe that justifies the kind of flattering story we like to tell about ourselves. In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. Another example of a straw man. Who says that the reason there are billions and millions of galaxies within the universe is because human beings were going to be created who has ever like what? <laughs> dr craig the person who he's debating surely has not made that argument and at the moment he kind of went away from dr craig's arguments like probably 15 minutes ago like he hasn't really addressed anything that dr craig has said uh since earlier i can only recall one thing uh and that was that the fine tuning was was a uh, that was at the universe had a beginning. And then he said he wanted, wasn't even going to attack that premise. He was going to attack the one that said, if the universe did begin to exist, then it has a transcendent cause. So he goes to say, well, there are models where uh, the universe begins to exist without a, without a, a transcendent cause. But that contradicts his earlier statement that says that physicists don't deal with questions about God, but God is by definition transcendent. So a physicist, that would be a physicist uh, creating a model that uh, is not theologically neutral, as he, he mentioned earlier. That would seem to be very uh, theologically significant if, the, if uh, that's a naturalistic model of, of, of the universe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then he, he talked about the fine tuning. He agreed that that's the best argument, but said that he didn't believe in fine tuning. He, he thought that uh, what was the parameters of life for, the, for them to be finely tuned. Then he was like, God doesn't need to fine tune the universe. Then he said that, uh, uh, yeah. And then, you know, so he's kind of all over the place with these, with these points. And I don't think he's really interacting with, with Dr. Craig. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with, with each other to grow up under different local conditions. Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social. He think he said under uh, under theism that you would expect religious beliefs to be universal. Why well, think that every religious belief would be universal? And then he said there would be but multiple competing religions under naturalism. Why isn't this 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 chart uh, just a case of him going what's true, and I'm gonna put the truth the truth the things we agree on under naturalism, and the things we don't we disagree on uh, on under theism. What a person would expect is relative uh, to that person, so there is no objective uh, 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 truth about the matter. There is no deduction that we can make. Uh, so this is necess not necessarily true. It's obviously contingent on that person. Uh, so why he, why he thinks some of these things is it's beyond me. Uh, under theism, uh, eternal, unchanging, but under affected by social progress. Uh, so yeah, let's continue. Conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. 
Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all, so can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. Immanuel Kant famously said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. In other words, sure, you can find some physical explanation for the motion of the planets, but never for something as exquisitely organized and complex as a biological organism. Except, of course, that Charles Darwin then went and did exactly that. We can paraphrase Dr. Craig's message as saying, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the cosmos. But everything we know about the history of science and the current state of physics says we should be much more optimistic than that. Thank you. So let's just kind of tie up some strands, uh, as Dr. Craig uh, usually says in his debates. So Sean Carroll wants to say that the naturalist uh, method of creating models, uh, looking at the data, creating models that best explains the data, works. He wants to say that there, the evidence is against theism. And I guess that last part was to consider his evidence against theism. And the way that argument worked is that under theism, you expect A, but you get not A. Uh, so therefore, uh, under theism, what you expect, you don't you, you don't really get uh, that. That whole argument depend uh, hinges on him being right in what we would expect under theism. but where does he get where did he get that from like it seems like that whole side of what he would expect under theism is what he would expect under theism and it doesn't seem like what he, uh, what someone some theist would expect and then you can get two different theists exp one, expecting different things given given the truth of, of theism so that like that whole line of reasoning uh is false uh because what a person would expect depends on the person uh, therefore, there's no, it's not, it's not true. Basically, uh, you can be a theist and not expect what he said that you would expect if you were a thesis. I mean, if you were a theist, uh, therefore that 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 assumption and that line of argument is fine, false. Now, then he says theism isn't well defined. What what does he mean here? He uh, seems to suggest that theism. If if you can uh, come up with different explanations for things, giving theism, then that means theism isn't well defined. Can't you do the same thing with naturalism? Does that mean naturalism uh, isn't well defined? Uh, could you say, well, uh, Johnny uh, had a uh, disability; he couldn't walk. And uh, suddenly Johnny, when he went to a prayer meeting, Johnny got up from his wheelchair. He started walking. Could the naturalist say, well, he he thought he couldn't walk, but he just had a. Uh, it was psychosomatic. But if you presented evidence from a doctor that showed like some some cancerous uh, cells in his bones that prevented him from walking, couldn't the naturalist say, well, well, you know, the, the universe is a mysterious place. Uh, others have been known to suddenly regenerate. It's a power of the human body. Uh, you could always explain things from your worldview, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's it's not well-defined. It means that that's a worldview. Uh, so uh, with that being said, 
he 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 did a rapid fire. He made a lot of points, and it's not really connected with a lot of things Dr. Craig has said. He did make some uh, claims of fact that Dr. Craig was wrong on certain uh, facts and 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 about theories and what they entailed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so that's that's Cheryl, Sean Carroll's opening statement. Hey, well, thanks for joining me tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed this and stay tuned when we look at uh, Dr. Craig's response in our next video this week. Thank you. This is Dr. Coder. Remember to think better. <laughs>